Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who is joining us for this roundtable conversation. My name is Tracy Rector, and I'm the Managing Director of Storytelling for Ania Taro Foundation and a 20-year veteran filmmaker. I currently reside on the homelands of the Puyallup peoples, and I uh, just want to honor that I am a guest in these territories. Um, and thank you, Zoe, from Mill Valley Film Festival for creating a safe space for this conversation and for also mentioning um, your land acknowledgments of the indigenous lands for which the festival is based upon, which are the Ohlone and Miwok peoples. Uh, we truly appreciate that honor and um, acknowledgement of the first peoples of these territories and lands. Welcome everyone to the round table. This forms one of two centerpiece events that are part of Mind the Gaps events at the festival. The theme of this year's festival 2020 is the politics of now, how the pandemic and the global uprising are shaping the industry and how the current time provides an opportunity to reframe the reality we have all experienced, in particular, centering the voices of those who have remained on the margins for far too long. Both the centerpiece events, building your own table and chairs and changing the industry from the inside work in tandem. There is no way to engage the industry if you're being marginalized, um, but broadly speaking, two distinct but overlapping approaches have been adopted by organizations that represent the interest of women, BIPOC persons, LGBTQIA peoples and peoples with disabilities. Certain organizations believe that the industry is perfectible, meaning that it has the power and the ability to change. And these organizations as such invest their efforts in changing the industry from the inside and or creating new systems. Other organizations prefer to focus their attention on building alternative networks, platforms, and ecosystems alongside the mainstream industry in which their communities can flourish, create new power structures, and set their own rules. Many combine a mixture of both approaches to varying degrees as well. Through the experiences of individuals and organizations, the centerpiece events explore both of these options. Today's conversation will focus on organizations, collectives, and initiatives who are doing their level best to change the industry by trying to improve it from the inside and make it more inclusive to women and non-binary people, queer people, BIPOC people, and others and people with disabilities. Their aim is that the industry becomes a space where all these groups can be treated equitably and have a true sense of belonging. Today we'll be joined by, and we'd like to welcome the following guest. And um, I'll signal to each of you in a circle uh, to go ahead and introduce yourselves. First, we'll start with Tulane. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tulane Jones, and I'm president of Array. Um, I am a Black and Korean woman, um, and you have the background of my dining room. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, Lucy, may I ask you to introduce yourself? Hi, Lucy Mucci. I'm a film producer and film curator. Um, I'm a queer biracial woman. I'm currently in a basement in Toronto. Um, and uh, I'm a senior programmer at the Tribeca Film Festival, among other organizations that I'm involved with. Um, and I should also mention I'm a co-founder with Temba Bebe of the Programmers of Color Collective. It's been a, an amazing global initiative. Thank you for that work. Liliana, uh, may I ask you to introduce yourself? Yes, of course. I'm Liliana Espinosa, Projects Director at NALIP, the National Association of Latino Independent Producers. I have been there for about four to five years now. I lost track already. Uh, I'm a Latina and I am in front of an off-white background. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for your introduction. Emily, may I invite you in? 
Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Badix. I'm the Associate Director at the Longmore Institute on Disability at San Francisco State University. And we are the coordinators of Superfest Disability Film Festival, which is the longest running disability film festival in the world. Um, I am a white woman. I have curly hair today and um, some hoop earrings in. And I'm sitting in front of a, black, a blank background. Thank you. Great. And Adriana? Hello, bonjour. My name's Adriana Chartrand. I'm an indigenous and white woman. I'm Mitchif Irish French. I'm the Institute Manager at Imaginative, uh, which is a film festival and an organization that runs year round professional development programs for indigenous people. And I'm speaking to you from Toronto, uh, which is the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Huron Wendat peoples, and the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Great, thank you everyone. And just again, um, to acknowledge accessibility needs, I am Tracy Rector. I am sitting in the office with a background, an office background with some original artwork and I'm wearing red and I have curly black hair. All right, so let's get into this. I'm really excited to hear from each of you uh, about the work that you do, but I wanna start off with a question. Um, and just jumping right in, um, what are the barriers and challenges that you see in changing the industry from within? And to start this conversation, I'm going to go in a circle, and then after that, we can just freeform the, com the combo. So let's start with Tulane. Thank you, Tracy. Um, uh, I've been working in the industry for over 11 years um, through Array, um, which was founded by filmmaker Ava DuVernay. Um, I feel very fortunate um, that I was able to enter um, the industry um, with a black woman, black woman owned company, now black woman run company. Um, and I think, um, you know, just the frame of mind of many people that are in the industry um, around entertainment and what audiences want to see. Um, also the misnomer that a lot of the work that we do doesn't travel um, internationally, um, I think is a, a large hurdle that we've been trying to tackle um, throughout the years. Um, and I think that we're starting to um, see some light ahead of the tunnel when it comes to um, art made by people of color and women of all kinds. Um, and so we're just really excited to see um, what the future brings. Thank you so much. Um, I've just been such a fan of the work. Uh, Ava first came to Seattle uh, working with Langston Hughes, and that was just a, a, such an inspiring moment for us in terms of indigenous media making and deciding to create new systems and just taking up space and making our own spaces. So, Absolutely. Uh, I remember that I was with her. I actually um, lived in Seattle for a while. And um, uh, I can say that Langston Hughes um, Film Festival is one of those festivals that actually helped us start our distribution collaborative um, and was one of the reasons why we decided to um, distribute films for ourselves and for other filmmakers of color. It was foundational. Thank you for that work. Emily, may I invite you in to talk about the barriers and challenges that you perceive in changing the industry? Yes, absolutely. I think when it comes to disability, um, you know, there are so many films made about disability every year that are, are in the mainstream. And if an actor plays a disabled characters, character, they're said to increase their chances of winning an Oscar. Um, but it has just been a, a huge um, ongoing battle to make sure that disabled people are playing their, their own parts with 95% of um, disabled characters played by non-disabled people. Uh, it's just a huge barrier. And I think that one of the biggest reasons why that's happening is just Hollywood ex itself and the, the physical spaces and studios are still so inaccessible. Um, so, you know, the work is both the, the physical barriers that need to change and also just the assumptions that are being made about, um, you know, about disability and that, that's leading to these continued problematic tropes. And so much of why that's happening is because disabled people aren't in the room to talk about the stories that, that they want shown. You know, this is IDA week, and uh, the last IDA, I believe, they focused on this area in terms of coalition building. Have you seen change from that momentum at all? 
Um, I think it's been a really unique moment. This past year has had a huge amount of positive momentum for disability, um, largely due to a, a, a really wonderful film that was released on Netflix called Crip Camp. Um, and, and it won Sundance's uh, Audience Award, and it also pushed Sundance to do a whole new initiative of, about making the, the film festival itself more accessible this year. So it's really exciting to see that sort of momentum. At the same time, I know a filmmaker with a disability whose film was passed over because they're like, well, we've, we've got Crip Camp, you know? So uh, it shows just how much work there is still, it's certainly opening some doors as, as well as part of this sort of wider movement, um, uh, but there's, there's so much farther to go still. So. Right, breaking through the barriers of being put into niche categories, and we've got that one film. Uh, thank you for your insight. And Adriana, of course, Imagine Native has just blown my mind <laughs> for so many years and just being unapologetically indigenous in every approach and just systems busting. What are what are your thoughts and feelings about the barriers still and the challenges in the industry? Sure. Uh, thanks, Tracy, um, for the kind words about Imaginative. Uh, I think like a lot of uh, marginalized or underrepresented filmmakers, funding and resources is always a huge challenge. Uh, in particular for Indigenous films, I think there's a challenge in... Um, a lot of gatekeepers and decision makers not necessarily understanding indigenous cultures and worldviews. So that's a challenge then to understanding indigenous stories and greenlighting them. Uh, and also, you know, 500 years of colonization. And I don't say that facetiously. I mean that we have 500 years of racist attitudes ingrained um, in people towards indigenous people. There's people that don't know that indigenous people are still alive, <laughs> you know, that we're still living on our lands and that we still exist. So. Uh, definitely an uphill battle in terms of those attitudes and, and people's knowledge, I think. Um, but there have been some positive changes lately. So I think um, hopefully things are changing. Thank you. And Liliana, you've been part of some um, groundbreaking conversations as well and just uplifting women, POC, Latinx, um, all over in so many different realms and sectors. Could you please speak to the challenges that you are seeing? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think as everybody here, uh, we're going through many of those same situations, right? Uh, from the Latinx perspective, I mean, there's just so much that can be done, right? Uh, we just last year uh, teamed up with with uh, Dr. Stacy Smith at USC Annenberg um, Inclusion Initiative, and we came out with a study, and the numbers were astonishing. We knew they were bad, but we didn't know they were that bad. Um, so it, it was just an eye opener of how much more we have to we have to break through those barriers. I mean, just you know from. 2007 to now, there is only 3% of uh, leads and co-leads of Latinx um, being featured, right? So that's just to show you just a, a little bit of what still needs to be done. So I think that working all together, um, un united, is going to be what, what helps create that bigger impact and change and breaking through those barriers. Thank you so much. And Lucy, as a change maker and community organizer, while also holding this experience, for example, of working with Tribeca Film Festival, what are you seeing in terms of um, barriers within the industry? I think um, the barriers that exist to exclude marginalized identities can really be summed up with the words blind spots. Um, and I'll give some examples of those. Entry fees for film festivals. Um, I know that, that might be controversial, um, but it's, it's clearly keeping out um, certain creatives who don't have the means. Um, and then we're missing out, um, we being the festival, but also wider audiences um, are missing out on, on enjoying and experiencing those works. Um, Another example is talent to watch programs that don't allow formal submissions and instead rely on the organizers existing networks. That's incredibly dangerous in my opinion. Um, the criteria that's necessary for filmmakers to qualify for grants um, 
for example, uh, requiring that a filmmaker must have X many produced films before they can apply for funding. And that, that's just perpetuating this cycle of excluding entire generations um, of communities from making work. Um, and then another example is the, the many, many female-focused initiatives that totally ignore trans and non-binary folk, all in the name of um, promoting gender equality. Uh, are any of you seeing specific areas of resistance? And I can give an example. The New Zealand Film Commission has done some incredible features that are collaboratively made. And so I've noticed that within some film festival networks, there's been pushback about like, well, we have to just focus on one person. We can't focus on a collective, but this goes uh, squarely against many of our cultural beliefs as POC peoples, that it's not always about the patriarchy or the hierarchy, but about collective energies. And um, that's really exciting to see that happening within our independent film communities. But I do notice the industry in general is just kind of struggling with, wait, what? <laughs> it's not a hierarchy. How do we work with these models? Um, so just as an example of some resistance I'm seeing, what have you all been noticing? I can jump on to that, Tracy. Um, I 100% agree with you. I think a lot of Indigenous um, people and Indigenous production teams do not work uh, with a hierarchy. It's much more collaborative, and I think that's... Um, a sort of uh, a mindset change that needs to happen from decision makers and funders. Um, and also sort of along that same line is uh, production timelines. Um, I know that a lot of Indigenous productions, not all of them, but um, a lot of them follow certain protocols when filming in a community or speaking to elders and things like that, that are part of the story um, that just can't be rushed and they aren't necessarily gonna happen on the set, you know, bam, 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 production timeline that the funders wanna see. So I think understanding that that uh, production time sometimes needs to be lengthened to tell these stories in a good way and in an authentic way uh, and that that's okay to do. I think that's an, a big challenge, particularly in Canada with funding right now. I love that example about production timelines. Uh, Lynn Shelton, who recently just passed, is another person that I look towards as a mentor who really challenged that, um, you know, time is money kind of militaristic um, approach to filmmaking and wanted to um, institute more of a nurturing familial experience as part of the process. Um, which I think has influenced a number of other directors and producers. And I, just to kind of touch upon that, that resistance, right, uh, pushback question that you, you were discussing, um, you know, I agree. I think that uh, it's kind of sometimes about meeting a certain quota, right, in terms of, of um, you know, writers or directors or anything like that. Uh, but I I think that we need to be considered as a, you know, it's a bigger picture than that, right? So this whole uh, trickling down from the DNI programs or anything like that um, is, is not enough. I think it needs to be, uh, we need to be part of the general conversation, not just about the inclusion conversation, right? Like, oh, well, from our inclusion program, um, how many directors or writers do we have? It should be, we should now at this point, I think, be considered of being part of that bigger picture, not just about the, you know, diverse and inclusion programs that are out there. So I think that that's a, a bit of a pushback there of like, oh, we're working with our DNI programs or whatever the case may be. But I think it's, uh, it's important to be part of a bigger, bigger issue here. I also think that there's this, you know, increase in openness to diversity, but then certainly that has not yet um, made many spaces for intersectional diversity. So, you know, one of the biggest um, disability films to have been in the mainstream Hollywood that was pretty widely accepted within the disability community um, was focused on the story of a white disabled man. And he, it was based on a real person who was also somebody who frequently liked to dress up as a woman. 
And the filmmaker, you know, was intrigued to play around with that, but just was like, oh yeah, there, there's no way I can get that in there also. And it's just so frustrating to see this linear model of like, oh, we'll take one thing at a time without willingness to just sort of say, well, if we're having this diversity conversation, why aren't we also jumping straight to showing the showing films that are disabled people of color or, you know, continue the list, but yeah. To lay then doing this work, really changing the industry, um, you know, head on, um, what are you seeing as the consistent barriers that keep coming up in the resistance in asking and demanding for change? Um, you know, I think my personality and, and the way I work in my style is I don't really look at resistance. That's not what I'm looking at. That's not what I'm challenged by. That's not what motivates me to do the work that I do every day. I know it's there. It's always been there. Um, it's historically there for all of us as people of color and as women. Um, and I think, you know, what we've done with Array and the, the way we work with Array is really, you know, the talk about inclusion, diversity, it's part of our DNA. We don't even have those conversations because you know, that's not what we look like. That's not what the films that we distribute look like. Um, I think that you know, whatever the challenges are um, that we have worked to really want every group to be included for all of us to work together um, to make that change. And that's where we're really gonna see it is when you know, organizations like Array and Nalip and uh, imaginative and um, you know all the other organizations really come together um, and create partnerships right to tackle what those obstacles are uh, there are many there are many you know what I mean we know how long they are we can write history books about them but really you know when I have these types of conversations or when I create partnerships or when I'm selecting a film my focus really is on the storyteller who's telling the story, how they're telling the story, and how can we partner together to amplify that, right? To make our own. And, and, and I think making our own, creating our own, you know, um, amplifying and also teaching our audiences how to watch our films, um, educating our audiences um, is really what's going to eliminate those obstacles, um, you know, rather than the focus on the obstacles. That makes me think of the campaign you had uh, last November for the film that you rolled out, mm -hmm. that you went for the community. And I think the Twitter hashtag that you had put out with the campaign was the largest ever or seen for that day. Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, yeah, that was for The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open, which is um, an indigenous film uh, with uh, LMI Tailfeather. Um, and Kathleen Hepburn, um, starring Violet Nelson. Um, and we did have um, a, uh, a campaign where we asked everyone to name where they are, right? Name the tribe and the land that they are on and honor that land. Um, and it did, it had a, 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 got a lot of traction on Twitter. Um, and it was really kind of the anti-Thanksgiving um, type of campaign um, where our focus was really on thanking, um, you know, the ancestors that were on the land before and who the land belonged to um, versus um, what Thanksgiving really stands for. Um, and so that was just one way, um, you know, in which we are trying to make change, you know, we, we not and, and, you know, through that film, we were able to do hopefully got a lot more people and a lot more eyeballs to be able to watch the film as well. It's such a great example of not listening to an industry saying like people don't want to hear your stories or, you know, kind of the same old tropes, but really just leveraging the work and going out to the people to uh, cultivate new eyes and new ways of seeing. Thank you for that. <laughs> Absolutely. It was our honor to be able to um, amplify the film and amplify the message um, and what the filmmakers wanted to see from the film. I think that's really important too, um, is kind of having that focus on, you know, what, who does the filmmaker want this film to be seen by and how do they want to affect change and really working towards, you know, that, you know, that vision um, for their work. Thank you. And I was just going to um, add on that, Talene, about how important it is to educate, right, how people watch our films, because a lot of people might see a film that seems to be, you know, of people of color, but it's not an authentic 
story because it might not be told by, um, you know, our point of view. Uh, so that's also very important to know uh, when the story is authentic because it is written by us, right? As opposed to when it's written by other people for us. So I think that's important. I think this generation and uh, these new eyes of young people also are something to look towards. I think about my boys and how, um, you know, in terms of, you know, my oldest. And so I'm still learning. I'm on a journey. My oldest child is non-binary. And so just learning how to have this language and embody the worldview that they are walking in so many nuances and complexities and how that's changing the type of media they want to see and be part of. Um, and it's really calling me in to be more intersectional in my thinking as well as the media maker. With that, what role um, do organizations led by BIPOC peoples, LGBTQIA communities, um, persons with disabilities play in changing the status quo? I can jump in here. I think um, BIPOC-led organizations are the only hope for any sort of forward movement. Um, one of the um, issues that continues to hold back um, any progression in this space is um, a reluctance to collect demographics data um, on the communities being served. There's this um, sort of real resistance to, and often the, the case that's brought up is that it's about privacy, which is ridiculous. But until we have that data on um, the audiences, the artists um, that, that, we're, that our organizations and our work is serving, um, we, we're working sort of blind. Um, and I think that that's something that BIPOC-led organizations inherently know and don't fight against, but it's, um, it's the predominantly white institutions that feel some sort of resistance. Um, and until we have that data, all of us who embody a marginalized identity will stay invisible. And that's, that's something that's going to take um, a huge push collectively um, across the industry in order to change. You know, it, for me, it ties into the idea of indigenous people's sovereignty, um, being able to run our own organization. So indigenous organizations should be run by indigenous people. It's actually, it's a matter of sovereignty. It was one of the recommendations made um, in the Truth and Reconciliation Committee that indigenous people, you know, be in charge of, of our own stuff. And I think it is incredibly important um, yeah, just sort of adds that other layer because in Canada, you know, we still have the Indian Act. Um, status Indians are still wards of the state. So we are not sovereign. We don't have uh, control of our lands and our resources. So I think it's so important that Indigenous organizations are led by Indigenous people to model that sovereignty and to advocate for, for change. Yeah, and I, I think off of that, I, I, it's a big responsibility for organizations, right? And, and being that platform for people that don't feel they have a voice yet, right? How can we also prepare them uh, as creatives as much as possible? What resources can we provide uh, so they are as ready as possible so that there is no uh, excuse uh, of anybody saying that we're not ready or that there's not enough of us, right? There are, and I think that is a big responsibility for each of our organizations to make sure that we are seen. Indigenous organizations, or you know, we need to reclaim our space and our place, um, you know, within the industry, um, within the different countries that we live in. Uh, it's so important for us to tell our own stories, but as you said, you know, also run our own organizations. You know, run, um, you know, those production companies and um, you know everything from dis distribution to um, even you know the companies that are greenlighting these projects. Because if we own them, then we're going to green light them, right? If those stories make sense and um, uh, financially as well as um, just community base wise, I think. Um, so I totally agree with that statement. And, you know, we just have to reclaim what we have um, and uh, move forward as such um, 
gr great knowing about the data that's needed. I think that, you know, um, Array as a company is going to start moving forward in that way as well. Um, because we do know how um, important it is to have that information to be able to share and um, the way Naleep, uh, you know, partnered with Stacey Smith and getting, you know, that information, those studies are so important and so vital. Um, because for some reason, our industry is very much into numbers, even though we're a creative <laughs> industry, it's the numbers that um, seem to make the difference at the end of the day. I was going to mention on being seen and heard, I've num I noticed a number of databases recently, I think both at Array, BGDM, Brown Girl Doc Mafia, the Indigenous Film Board of Canada. Um, how are you feeling these opportunities to have access to BIPOC creatives um, and other persons will impact the industry? Because there's no excuse. It's like we know where to find people now. Exactly. And I think um, that's going to make a big difference. That's something that we're working on um, with the Programmers of Color Collective. Right now, um, there are 300 um, members who work as film curators around the world and identify as Black, Indigenous and people of color. And over the course of my career, um, on the festival side, I've consistently encountered leadership who've said, well, we can't find any BIPOC festival curators, so we don't need to, you know, they, they don't sort of, they don't know where to look, right? So they just throw up their hands and say, we can't do it, so we'll just continue business as usual. And then, of course, that, end, that results in an entirely white organization and um, programming that's deeply flawed. Um, so, uh, we're right now putting together um, a, an online database of members for the, for the POC2, that's our sort of acronym for our group, and the goal of that as well as um, internally providing community for each other in this very solitary role that we all play within our organizations, um, it's also a public facing database for um, leadership in the film festival circuit to know where they can come and find us and find people who have the experience, the qualifications, um, and the know-how to do this right. Um, I'm really excited about launching that. And I've also been watching um, Brown Girls Doc Mafia. Um, their rollout has been incredible. Um, so that's, that's really a group that we look up to as sort of uh, um, mentors in a way. Thank you so much. Emily, your thoughts? Um, just on the festival side of things, you know, we don't um, use the databases so much as we select all of our films just from an open call for submissions. But, you know, it has been a way that we've been pushing ourselves uh, because so often, you know, we really are looking for disability 201 conversations and not just disability 101 conversations. And so, you know, we're, we're looking for those films uh, that are diverse stories within disability or the most marginalized within disability um, and have had to do more and more work to go out and find those films if we don't get them as our open call for submission to make sure that that's, that's a core part of our festival. Or even, you know, in, in the past couple of years, we've had films that reach us and, you know, normally we would have just sort of said like, oh, this isn't a fit and, and turn them away, but instead have been more um, doing more proactive conversations about like, well, this wasn't a fit because of this, but we would still love to help see this story um, screened. So if you want to consider making this tweak happen or work, working more directly with filmmakers, even uh, if they're rejected from the festival, to see them get into the festival the following year. And that's been a way that we've been able to feature more diverse stories within disability as well. Thank you. Um, so, you know, thinking about this day and age, we are um, in the middle of a pandemic still. And, you know, as far as we can tell, this is going to be our reality through next year. How are you all seeing the impacts on your work and the potential changes within the industry, both good and bad? I think one of the big things um, that we're realizing in, um, in Canada, and I think it's likely true in, in the US and other places as well, um, while moving everything online can be more accessible in terms of people don't have to travel to wherever your festival is happening, you can get more people. At the same time, there's so many indigenous communities in Canada that don't have equitable internet service. So it's not this sort of blanket solution of accessibility that some people are, um, 
are touting it as. So we have, you know, reserves or indigenous communities that are already very geographically isolated and don't have things like healthcare and don't have internet. Now they also can't necessarily access what's happening um, online. So that's a big thing for us. We've kind of pivoted towards um, we're creating a podcast to go with this festival that can go out to sort of res radios and different stations um, to involve people that way. But I think, yeah, it's always, it's always a challenge for us to think of how to include all Indigenous people, not just people in urban centers. And um, yeah, with the pandemic, it's, it's definitely a challenge still, but we're, we're hoping we can find some ways around it. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, with our organization, we're so based in community and gathering. Um, and I think that has been just a different energy, um, you know, as far as um, being in the same space, being able to talk to one another face to face, being able to touch one another, being able to um, gather together, um, I think is the most challenging thing because, you know, Zoom, it's different. <laughs> We're all together, but we're not all together. And so, um, you know, I think finding ways around um, not being able to gather in the same space um, has been a challenge. Um, I think that um, it's also amplified um, the power of social media um, and how we gather in those spaces and how we use social media, um, you know, not just as a marketing tool, but really as um, a community tool um, to be able to get out the messages and get out the news and get out um, a lot of the things that, you know, we can't um, do now that, you know, we're, we're not together anymore. Um, and so I think we really have, over the seven months, um, really been curtailing that and trying to, um, you know, use it to its um, highest capability, which we may not have done so much um, before the pandemic happened. I think for disability, this has been a really unique moment where at the same time that you know, there's people who are terrified because they're more exposed or more at risk of COVID-19. There's also this sort of massive, uh, I told you so moment of disabled people who had been advocating for this for so long saying like, I can't come to a festival if it's in person because, you know, venues are so very un inaccessible still, or people have chronic pain and need to participate in bed. Um, and so our festival, uh, within the first, we, we didn't have anything planned in the spring, but we actually threw together a, a, a mini version of our festival online um, just three days after San Francisco shut down, which was one of the first places. And it was really just to show off and be like, we've been thinking about online access for a long time because that's that's how some people who are part of our community need to participate. And, uh, and a lot of people who are now benefiting um, who have various disabilities where they're like, the, the world has never been more accessible to me than it is right now, are very, very concerned that when things quote unquote return to normal, that all of this, this progress that's being made is just gonna go away. I think um, related to what Adriana said, um, even the work that we've done to include audio description for all of our films, then is an example of something that you build in for disability, but has other benefits for everyone. So um, now we can, uh, plug our festival as like, oh, and you can call in and you can experience a film by phone because of the audio description features that are provided for blind low vision users. So I think it's like a very interesting moment of activism, of optimism in the communities in which I'm in of like, okay, we knew how to do this. We were advocating for this and let's hope it, it, it sticks as people, um, as, as venues do reopen up that people continue this commitment to the virtual space. I think that um, just with everything going on, I think that is something that a lot of people are discussing right now of when we can actually gather, right? I think it'll definitely be a hybrid of both moving forward uh, just because we see the, you know, the, the positives of being virtual, of, you know, more accessibility, and of course, people with disability, all of those things are great. Uh, but there's also that, and then also we don't know if there's another pandemic that might be coming up, right? So we're always thinking about those things. So I think it will be moving forward, maybe a hybrid of both of having, yes, virtual uh, platforms, but also there is that, um, that connection, that community of being in person as well, that I feel especially creatives in the space uh, are missing because that is a lot of how they, they, they 
have business, right? Like that they make those connections at these events. I have plenty of people that have come up to me and said, oh, I met my producing partner at one of your events. And I met my, I, I got distribution funds because I met a so-and-so executive. Um, this is how they do business, right? And this is how they make those connections. And I think it's been really tough um, during this, these times of, of creating in, in a time of a pandemic um, and, and especially with the whole production and all of that going on. So I think moving forward, ideally would be a hybrid of doing something, uh, doing virtual, but also doing something of being able to gather and make those, those connections as well. I noticed those conversations in terms of how insular uh, just networking might shift again um, because people aren't in person meeting, connecting, introducing, um, and some concern over the power of Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, you know, and choosing what is seen, especially as art houses are starting to fold, some film festivals are starting to fold. Um, how like how do you all feel we can be navigating the power of the industry in this new way um, and understanding our indie BIPOC um, avenues for gathering um, are changing? Um, I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but I'll try. I think uh, I, I agree 100% um, with the idea that things will probably be hybrid in the future. Um, I think, you know, it's really important to have online stuff for that accessibility, but also to gather for that energy and that creativity um, and that networking. Um, but I do think that one possibility in, in this pandemic, because it has so disrupted, um, you know, theaters. Theaters are likely going to close. We don't have, we haven't had the same theatrical runs that we're used to. So I think there is an opportunity to affect change, um, especially in terms of distribution, which is always a huge challenge for um, Indigenous films and, and other underrepresented films. So I don't know what it is. I don't know what the solution is, but I think there's a, there's a window and an opportunity to come up with alternative forms of distribution that are viable and that are going to get these films seen um, to sort of replace or maybe become a hybrid of that traditional uh, theatrical distribution system. That's my hope, at least. <laughs> I'd love to add something here. I think that um, creating visibility for the art of film curation is going to be vital moving forward. One effect of the pandemic is that the fate of film curators is in a really precarious place. Um, many of us work on short-term contracts, juggling multiple gigs without protections like healthcare. Um, and with public gatherings being impossible, a lot of the film programming that is being done is happening with a skeletal team. So um, usually in many organizations, as we all know, that means folks of color are laid off first. Um, and so being able to have a sustainable career in the industry is proving to be a less attainable goal, which is really sad. Um, and using the example of the, the 300 members of the collective, these are people who are curating not just films, but the cultural conversations of their communities. And so it's a public service, the work that they're doing and, and seeing them not being able to sustain themselves, pay rent, et cetera, is, is really, a, it's a scary time. Um, I think with the pandemic, it's really um, also given us an opportunity to make positive changes and make it better. You know, I think a lot of the issues that we're having, you know, as an independent distribution company, we always had issues with budgets, um, you know, being able to fly a filmmaker to a certain city, another country, um, to have them participate in film festivals. If the film was in a film festival in another country where the film festival might not have a budget to be able to fly them in. I think we were nimble in that way in the beginnings of um, our distribution company because, you know, we knew, okay, we're going to have to Skype them in. We're going to have to do other things outside of um, the financial barriers that we have. And I just think that this is such an opportunity for um, a lot of um you know, organizations within the industry to make changes like having hybrids where we have in-person and also streaming because, you know, one, that doesn't just um, open us up within our community, but it really makes us international. It really makes us kind of cross borders that were really um, barriers for us before. Um, and so, you know, 
we at Array, we're, we're creating platforms, we're creating, um, you know, different things so that once we are back together, we still have an ability to be able to expand our audience. Um, and, you know, most organizations that are run by, um, you know, people of color, POC, women, um, we do have such limited budgets. And so just really um, kind of taking all the free tools that we have right now, especially with the pandemic happening, um, taking those things and expanding all those things, I think um, is vital. Um, and really what we've been working on for the past seven months is just how, what's not knowing what's gonna happen, not trusting in um, the direction that the government is giving us. Um, you know, how can we make those changes to make sure that we're more ex accessible um, to all different types of people, all, you know, all over the world. Um, I'm excited for it. I mean, I know it's, you know, really difficult for a lot of people who are out of work, crews that are out of work, you know, curators and, and, and folks in, in, in our um, landscape. But I'm hoping that this is going to allow you know, us independent organizations and independent creators to be able to um, kind of expand, you know, on the work that we're doing where we were really always limited by, you know, those borders and, and, and those different things um, uh, that were created uh, when we could meet in person. So who's going to create a new streaming platform? <laughs> That's why I want to see that. <laughs> Um, so I'm really uplifted uh, by a certain examples um, of power that's emerging in this time and just, you know, really not accepting the norms of the industry. And one example is Michaela's I Will Destroy You. Um, I think it's fascinating to see how certain people are choosing to make different choices right now, too. Um, any thoughts or opinions on that? Um, I could go on about it because I'm just in love with the concept and the idea and the process and the empowerment, but I'd love to hear from you all. We need more, more of it, more, 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 more. I mean, I love her. I love, you know, the, the shows that she's created. Um, and we just, we need more. It's now we see, you know, how transformative it can be, you know, when we are allowing um, different types of storytellers to tell different types of stories. Yeah, and I think that this is a, a great time to be able to to think outside of that same box that we were put in, right, of like, these are the, the guidelines, this is kind of what we're looking for. I think right now, all of that has gone out the window. And I think it's create art uh, that people want to see whatever your, your voice is, tell that story, right? Because I think right now is a great opportunity to do so. And I think we've seen it, that it works, and that people are listening to that, those types of, uh, you know, artworks. And owning the rights, you know, really taking a stand and saying, no, this old model does not work. Yeah, I think um, in terms of rights, owning the rights to your own original works, of course, and also a big conversation um, in terms of indigenous stuff is, is intellectual property when it comes to something like an indigenous traditional uh, story or an indigenous traditional myth or legend because it, there is no singular ownership of things like that in indigenous communities. You know, there might be a family that you have to get permission from and they hold one version of that story, another holds another. There's all kinds of stuff um, around that that people can take advantage of if they want to. So uh, indigenous IP in that sense is not protected by Canadian copyright law because it's not an individual owner, it's a collective thing. Um, so that's a huge thing that um, we also talk about and advocate for change in terms of that. Um, so I'm hoping that, yeah, with all these conversations and the industry being shaken up and people taking stands and owning their rights and things like that, that that will also become another conversation that people are aware of. Um, yeah, so hopefully good things in the future. <laughs> Absolutely. I think the pandemic has also shown us really what art can do for us mentally, not just, you know, viewing, but really, you know, during this time, I think um, most folks have consumed more art, film, television, um, magazines, you know, and just, you know, I just hope that it really um, shows the industry and shows audiences how important it is um, to allow people to create and allow people to not 
just create it, but people to see it, right? You can go through all the processes of making something, but if no one sees it, you know, what, what good is it doing? Um, you know, I, I, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about, you know, people seeing how mentally, you know, it's really with us all kind of being in our own homes and having to be on lockdown, um, you know, music and, and film and, you know, the arts are important. I think, especially in the United States, um, you know, so many arts programs have been discontinued um, in schools and universities and um, the value of art has kind of been lost, um, I think, in this past generation. And so, you know, with this happening, I'm hoping that um, it will increase the value of, you know, where art is as far as, you know, who we are as individuals and um, our mental space and safety and health. I like at this circle of incredibly um, talented, powerful, spiritual, you know, individuals here in the organizations that we represent. And um, I can't help but to think about our buying power too. <laughs> and just what happens if we start leveraging all of our communities to really make choices and how that will impact the industry. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about trillions of uh, buying power there. So I think that matters a lot, yes. And so with that, how do you see the importance of allyship between you know, synergistic organizations like ours um, and then also within the industry too? And how can we move forward these changes collaboratively? I know it's super fast. That's been an amazing opportunity for us. I, I was uh, took over the festival. Um, my organization took it over seven years ago, and and it had been kind of playing by itself. And in the past seven years, we've built relationships with so many of the local San Francisco film festivals, Camfest, and SF Film, and that's been a really great way for us to partner and um, be a be a place where we can give them the guidance of how to start having accessible programming. Uh, you know, none of them have all everything accessible yet, but like even if they're offering one or two screenings that have some really great access features, and then in exchange, they're really helping us by signal boosting our festival to their folks that, you know, maybe don't think about a disability film festival is appealing and, and for them to promote it and say like, this is gonna be great film that matters to all of you film buffs out there, even if you don't think of disability as being part of your life. I think it's incredibly important, like the allyship and the partnership between organizations in terms of visibility and promotion, but also in terms of, um, you know, giving you that energy and that hope to keep going um, at times when it can be really hard and really draining and, you know, really emotional and really stressful and seeing other people's um, successes or having other people to talk about your similar challenges with, I think is is just everything. We, I know we draw a lot of power uh, and energy from that as an organization. I hope we're able to also give that to other organizations, but I, I don't think that should be underestimated. I think it's so important, um, you know, in these BIPOC organizations that we have that sort of energy exchange as well. I definitely think it's vital. Um, you know, that's how our organization is run. And um, I look forward to all the different partnerships. I can't wait to talk to all of you after this conversation. <laughs> As we're talking, I'm like thinking of different things. So um, it's, it's absolutely vital that we all work together and just amplify one another and um, keep each other moving um, at all times, even when times are better. Um, you know, that's when we can all celebrate together. So we have uh, five minutes left and we have kind of a quick question for every one of you and um, we'll just go around in a circle to answer. But the question is, um, so if we use the power of radical imagination to envision an idealized or inclusive film industry, what would that look like? And we'll start with Tulane. Wow, that's a big question <laughs> that I have two seconds to think about. Um, uh, I think that um, that there will be a time where we don't have to have these types of conversations, that there'll be a time when inclusion and diversity is not in question, it just is. Um, when we can all um, freely um, be able to create our work um, and have our audiences enjoy our work, um, and, you know, those two words mean nothing um, to the entertainment industry anymore because 
um, it, that's exactly what it is. Definitely agree with that. And, and just, you know, that there doesn't have to be a NALIP for the purpose that there is, right? That we're here to celebrate all of the amazing accomplishments uh, as opposed to be in the trenches trying to, to advance projects, trying to make sure that people are being seen, right? Um, so hopefully there's a time where our organization's mission will change and that it will be more of a celebratory um, type of organization because things are pretty, pretty good out there, right? Where we see a lot of us being represented, where we see a lot of us, uh, you know, being acclaimed. So I, I agree with Talene. I, 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 I hope to see more of that in a, in a perfect world out there. I absolutely agree with both of those points. Um, the one other thing I'd add from the perspective of the work we do is it's, it's so frustrating with some of the filmmakers we work with where they say, oh, we'd like to make our film accessible, but it's already done. And so my sort of like futuristic dreaming would be that nobody thinks of their film as done until it inc incorporates those accessible features. Well said. Thank you, Emily. Um, I think for me, an, an idealized and inclusive film industry would look like queer women of color in leadership roles at organizations. Um, because when that happens, these organizations will be run by gate openers, not gatekeepers. Um, we all know that one of the reasons for discrimination in the workplace is that historically white cisgender men have hired people who look like them. Um, and I feel like now the conversation is getting to a place where um, the perception of who is hireable, who is an ideal candidate is changing. Um, and I think that's that level of um, sort of real uh, deep thought internally at organizations is what's going to change the landscape of the industry into a more inclusive place. Uh, yeah, I don't have uh, anything else to add. I think they all summed it up really well. Uh, gatekeepers and decision makers that aren't just cis white men and you know our our missions changing because we're here to celebrate the work rather than necessarily advocate for a place at the table yeah i often think about um you know more joy you know that we're not necessarily tied to stories of overcoming or pain or the journey but just that we get to tell the stories that we want to tell unabashedly from our own perspectives more native comedies. Yes. <laughs> that will be another sign of an inclusive uh, industry. <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you so much. It's um, you know always powerful to be in the company of strong leaders, and I just want to thank you for your time and for your insights and for um, the energy that you brought to this space. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you.